Irv Mendelson is a uh, Dr. Irv Mendelson is a professor with Louisiana State University, and he's going to be talking with us about uh, impacts, uh, impact and recovery of wetland vegetation. And a fun fact about Irv is that uh, I like to get fun facts about my guest speakers, and his fun fact is that uh, my favorite hobbies have been skiing and wine tasting, not always at the same time. All right, take it away, Dr. Mendelssohn. Very good. Well, hello everyone and thanks, Emily. And good afternoon to everyone. So my objective today is to provide an overview. See if this will work. An overview of deep water horizon impacts and coastal wetland vegetation and to discuss factors controlling impact and recovery. So this presentation is based on a GOMRI-sponsored effort led by Brian Roberts at LUMCON to synthesize our knowledge of wetland responses in general. Now I'm leading up the uh, vegetation component uh, with the assistance of Brian and Scott Zangel at RPI. And this presentation will try to summarize some of our findings. Now, I don't have time to go into detail as much as I might like to, but I will try to cover some of the main points and to provide a few representative examples from the literature to illustrate uh, these points. Today, you will hear four present presentations that address deep water rise and impacts to coastal marsh vegetation and the habitat to Necton and to community-related ecosystem services and human health. My presentation today on vegetation response will provide first a brief overview of the spill, then I'll describe the geographic extent and oiling severity, and I'll mention the wetland habitats that were affected, and then I'll get into addressing salt marsh vegetation, and I'll specifically talk about growth impacts. Uh, there are also, in the literature, impacts to genomics and physiology, which uh, we'll have to wait for another time. Then I'll get into recovery and the importance of revegetation in that recovery uh, and impacts to other wetland types if I have enough time. And then finally, I'll try to draw some conclusions and, and wrap up. So as we all are aware, it was on April 20th, 2010, that the Deepwater Horizon drilling platform exploded, resulting in the largest marine oil spill in US history, and unfortunately costing the lives of 11 individuals. For 87 days, oil was released from the Macondo well uh, into the Northern Gulf of Mexico about 4.9 million barrels of oil were spilled into the Gulf. Now about 800,000 barrels were collected, leaving an estimated 4.1 million barrels moving towards the north central coast of the Gulf of Mexico. The oil was transported by currents and waves, weathered to different degrees, and finally reached beaches and coastal wetlands as seen in this synthetic aperture radar image of Barataria Bay, Louisiana by Garcia Panetta et al. Emergent coastal wetlands, uh, including salt marshes, mangroves, and reed beds, as well as kilometers of beaches were oiled. And some of this oiling was extremely heavy. This is a, a SCAT or shoreline cleanup assessment technique map from Michelle et al. And I'm sure most of you, if not all, have seen this before. And it shows uh, the oiled and unoiled shorelines in the Northern Gulf. And by far the largest volume of wetland oiling occurred in Louisiana. That's in contrast to Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida, which received much less uh, oiling to their wetlands. Michelle et al, based on SCAT data, reported that there were almost 800 kilometers of oiled wetlands, or 16% of the sur surveyed shorelines that were oiled. And then two years later, Nixon et al, 
published uh, data based on SCAT and also other assessments of oiled shorelines and estimated a larger amount of uh, oiled wetland shorelines at about 1,100 kilometers. So that's about 17% of the wetland shorelines that they surveyed. So for argument's sake, let's just say that there was about 1,000 kilometers of wetland shorelines that were oiled, and this is for Louisiana, but also uh, Mississippi, Alabama, and, Tech and uh, Florida. But remember, they had very, very, uh, very few oiled wetlands. So this turns out to be about 600 miles of oiled shoreline, which is the distance from Houston to Baton Rouge and back. So this is not a trivial amount of oiling uh, by any means. A number of different wetland types were exposed to the oil. So for example, if onto the Sasser et al. vegetation map of 2013 for the Delta Plain of Louisiana, I superimpose oiled shorelines, which are these white lines that you see. Uh, you'll notice that salt marshes, the red polygons, were most affected. These salt marshes, like those around Bay Jimmy and the north central Barataria Bay, are dominated by two species primarily, Spartina alterniflora and Juncus romerianus. In addition, mangroves dominated by Abyssinia germinans, which are embedded within the salt marsh polygons, were also oiled. And Abyssinia exists not only in the area you see on this, on this image, but throughout southwestern, uh, throughout the, the coast of Louisiana and elsewhere. And finally, at the mouth of the Mississippi River, fresh and low salinity marshes of the Birdsfoot Delta dominated by the common reed Phragmites or rosocane were also oiled. Aerial images and photographs clearly show that marsh shorelines receive the brunt of the heavy oiling, with oil often extending from five to 10 meters into the marsh interior. As reference, uh, the oil shoreline indicated by the red arrow that I just put up is 10 meters in, in depth from the shoreline interface inland. But oil movement further than 10 meters was definitely documented. So oil incursions of 10 to 20 meters into the marsh interior determined from either, from either Macondo fingerprinted oil chemistry or from remote sensing were documented. There were there were other measurements of oiling as far as 40 and 100 meters into the marsh. So based on the published literature, we can say that Macondo oil moved anywhere from 10 to 100 meters shore perpendicular into these marshes. However, uh, we cannot rule out oil movement more than 100 meters uh, as oil might have moved up tidal creeks or remobilized by storms as during Tropical Storm Lee in September of 2011, as documented in this photograph by Zangle et al. But we, we do have definite documentation of oil moving as far as 100 meters, at least in some marshes and possibly further. Oil impact of vegetation can also be a function of whether the oil penetrated the soil. Uh, and this, especially along heavily oiled shorelines, as you see in this photograph. Oil often pulled below the marsh vegetation and allowed oil to penetrate the soil in some locations, as you see here, especially during warm temperatures, times of warm temperatures. Although the highest oil concentrations were in the top two centimeters of the soil surface, as shown by research uh, by Atlas et al., the Macondo oil also penetrated as far as eight centimeters into the soil. And there's, there are other data suggesting that, that oil in certain locations, these heavily oiled sites, may have gone even, even further. But this is an area that needed a lot more research to quantify. <clears throat> 
So not surprisingly, uh, oil impacts also, uh, certainly oil impacts depended on oiling intensity. This is no surprise. Oil impacts on plant growth were greatest with heavy oiling and less with moderate oiling as shown by Lyndon Mendelssohn for field results in Bay Jimmy. Hester et al. found similar results over a much larger geographic area for the, for the totality of the Louisiana Delta Plain. With more severe oiling, as indicated on the x-axis here, reducing vegetative cover. And similar effects were observed in the two years following the spill as well. Oil impacts were also dependent on distance to the shore water interface, with impacts decreasing with increasing distance inland, as seen in this field study by Silliman et al. that occurred in, in Bay Jimmy. The negative effect of oiling uh, decrease with distance inland uh, was also shown in this remote sensing work by Canna et al. And they found that the negative effect of oiling basically ceased at 20 meters into the marsh. So the shoreline area and inland into 20 meters, there was a definite effect on the vegetation, but beyond 20 meters in their, in their research, they found no effect of the oil. Interestingly, oil impact varied with plant species as well. Juncus romerianus was more sensitive to moderate Macondo oiling from Subretina alternate flora, as reported by Lyndon Mendelssohn for the Bay Jimmy area. And you'll notice, however, that with heavy oiling, both species, both Spartina and Juncus, were completely killed. Willis and Hester found similar results for the coastal marshes of Mississippi and Alabama. So I'm not leaving out Mississippi and Alabama in this particular slide. Uh, notice that Juncus, which is the stipple bars, decreased with increasing oiling level, uh, while Spartina basically stayed the same. And this was true in the following year, the fall of 2012, where the stippled uh, in the, uh, bars representing Juncus decreased uh, with increasing oiling. So there's very good evidence that uh, Juncus is much more susceptible to oiling than is Spartina alternate floor. It has long been recognized that salt marsh vegetation is resilient to oil spills. For example, in April 1985, a pipeline rupture released about 300 barrels of South Louisiana crude oil into this marsh just north of Empire, Louisiana on the west side of the Mississippi River. Shortly after the spill, almost all the vegetation was dead as a result of both plant and soil oiling. But when, and one year later, only minor recovery occurred, as you see here. In contrast, three years later, or four years after the spill, there was near complete recovery of the Spartina vegetation in this marsh, except for where mechanical damage during pipeline repair degraded the marsh substrate and where there were uh, existing, pre existing ponds in the marsh. So, findings like this, and there are many examples like this in the literature, uh, have promoted the idea of salt marsh resilience to oil. Signs of recovery were also apparent after the Deepwater Horizon spill. Even at heavily oiled sites, some new vegetative sprouts of Spartina occurred, as you see in this slide, in this photograph. Also, Phragmites produced new vegetative shoots from stems of oiled plants. And this, uh, as you'll see in a moment, was extremely prolific. Silliman et al. documented vegetation recovery from the Deepwater Horizon after only two years. Notice the difference in the proportion of live plants between impacted and reference marshes became less over time, continued to become less. And by January 2012, there was no difference between the proportion of live material in impacted versus reference marshes. 
So here we have recovery in two years. The degree of recovery, just like initial impact, however, varied with oiling intensity and distance from the shoreline. So certainly not all uh, shorelines recovered as fast as what I've just described. For example, uh, the gra this graph from Lynn et al. from the Bay Jimmy area shows that moderately oiled vegetation, those are the yellow bars, recovered to reference levels, uh, the green bars, after just 40 months, after 40 months. While in contrast, heavily oiled vegetation, those are the black bars, did not recover to reference levels even after 48 months. So obviously the extent of oiling has a major effect on, on uh, recovery as well as impact, initial impact. Distance from the shoreline is also uh, a factor that impacted recovery, as seen in the, this remote sensing study of Khan et al., who found that it was not until 14 meters and further into the marsh that all pixels that were oiled and denuded of photosynthetic vegetation in September of 2010 had recovered and were classified in 2011 as photosynthetic, i.e. live vegetation. So we see that not only impact, but uh, recovery was influenced by distance from the shoreline, which of course is related to the intensity of oiling, reduced oiling, uh, oil levels as you move inland. Recovery, like uh, initial impact, varied with plant species. This image shows a heavily oiled uh, Spartina, uh, ever, heavily oiled shoreline marsh composed of both Juncus and Spartina. And then 15 mo months later, plant recovery was underway, but only Spartina regrew and colonized these heavily oiled shorelines. Juncus did not come back, supporting uh, the actual data that we have on this. Shoreline erosion likely impaired recovery at some locations. We know that heavy oiling can reduce live below ground biomass, as shown by the black bars in this figure from Lynn et al. for Bay Jimmy field sites. As a consequence, soil shear strength, which is the ability of the soil to resist erosive forces, is reduced in heavily oiled marshes. Those are the black bars, but not moderately oiled, the yellow bars. This resulted in significant more surface erosion at heavily oiled sites. And marsh surface erosion can, of course, contribute to shoreline retreat. This is supported by the fact that when heavily oiled and mechanically clean shoreline plots were replanted with Spartina, as done by Brittany uh, Burnick and Scott Zeno, Zengel, what was found was that shoreline erosion was a, reduced by approximately two meters per year compared to unplanted plots. So planting as a remediation, as a way of pre preventing shoreline erosion after a spill was something uh, that uh, we learned as a result of this research. Although oiling often caused necrosis of above ground leaves and stems of Phragmites, Regrowth from oiled stems was apparent uh, uh, and very rapid. These are uh, new shoots from oiled stems in the greenhouse. The production of these new shoots was absolutely incredible. And that's what this graph shows, that with more, greater percentage of surface oiling of the vegetation of the Phragmites, there was this huge increase in the side shoots. And it was that increase in these vegetative shoots that allowed for above ground biomass to remain constant, even with 100% oiling. It was only oil added to the soil that had a, a, a significant effect in reducing growth. Avicinia, adjacent to shorelines, were significantly impacted by oiling, as found by Willis and Hester. When exposed to oiling uh, in mesocosm experiments, Avicinia 
showed a reduction in the number of leaves above ground. These were for seedlings, and this was worked on by Use It All. And also below ground biomass was significantly reduced by oiling. So we, we know that uh, certainly Abyssinia can be affected by oil spills. So in conclusion, we can say that uh, the impact and recovery were dependent on shoreline oiling intensity, distance from the shoreline, plant species, and oil penetration of the marsh soil, especially for Phragmites. Lightly oiled shorelines typically showed minor plant impacts and recovered quickly, while impacts along moderately oiled shorelines were more significant and resulted in slower recovery. The most severe impacts, not surprisingly, were found in heavily oiled marshes with impacts decreasing with distance from the shoreline. For both moderately and heavily oiled salt marshes, Juncus romerianus typically was more impacted than Spartina alternate flora and recovered more slowly, if at all. Recovery of both species was likely prevented along rapidly eroding shorelines, whether those shorelines had increased erosion due to oil or not. Phragmites dominated marshes, in contrast, although exhibiting dead leaves in many locations, had vegetation cover not significantly different from reference marshes, indicating the potential for rapid recovery. And finally, although limited published information exists for other vegetation types, including Abyssinia, Abyssinia dominated marshes adjacent to shorelines within this 1.5 meters were negatively impacted by oiling and there is certainly much uh, uh, evidence for that. So with that, I'll end and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have at the end of the uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Irv. That was excellent.